Well, good morning. It's uh, Sunday morning. It's Easter, and uh, God bless all of you today. And I know that many of you will be going to church and uh, celebrating uh, the Lord's resurrection. Um, today, I want to just talk about a few questions and uh, regarding the uh, the highest glory of God. And this is just meant to supplement whatever you're going to hear at church today. It's not to replace it, but I hope that you'll find it interesting. Let's begin uh, with our study today, or our sermon today, uh, with prayer. Uh, uh, Jesus, we love you, Lord. <clears throat> we praise you. We thank you, God, for everything that you've done for us. We uh, worship you, Lord, and we praise you. And Hosanna to the highest. Everybody said amen. Okay, let's begin with the, uh, the PowerPoint. <clears throat> and as usual, uh, it is March 27th. 2016 it is approximately 8 30 a.m. I want to talk about the highest glory of God and uh, so let's start with that and uh, let's ask a question what public event initiated the glorification of Jesus of Nazareth uh, of course you could say that uh, his baptism uh, his transfiguration uh, I think that those are all good answers. Uh, the healing of uh, the woman with the issue of blood, the uh, uh, Tabitha, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, miracles that Jesus did, the, uh, the turning uh, water into wine, the loaves and the fishes. But there's one unique event that initiated the glorification and, and, uh, of Jesus of Nazareth. And here, here's what I think it is. Uh, it's found in John 11, verse 2 through 6. And the Bible says it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Uh, just to reset the uh, history here, Jesus had been at Lazarus' house in Bethany. This is where Judas and his father acted very badly. There was a leper there, and uh, his name was Simon. And uh, he said, this spikenard should be sold to uh, give to the poor. And then Judas, of course, uh, repeated those words to Jesus. And Jesus, of course, said... You know, you guys, all you ever think about is money. And uh, it's not really what's going on here. What you, what's going on here is that you're jealous that this woman has gotten close to me. And you're not getting the attention that she's getting. And he said, she has done this for my death. And so uh, uh, that was the, uh, the event uh, uh, right before Jesus came into Jerusalem. But there was an event prior to that. And uh, we're not sure how long it was, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe six months, uh, can't really say. But Lazarus was raised from the dead. Therefore his sisters, it says in verse 3, said unto Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus loved Martha, his sister, uh, her sister, uh, Mary, and Lazarus. So when he had heard, therefore, that Lazarus was sick, he stayed an additional two days in the same place where he was. It's clear that this miracle, Jesus could have came and he could have healed Lazarus at any time. And, of course, uh, the message was, you know, your, your friend that you love is sick. And this could be the disciple whom Jesus loved that was, that was uh, 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 leaned on his chest during the Last Supper. But we don't know. But anyway, Jesus delayed because there was something that he wanted. He was going to set into motion the events that resulted in his crucifixion. And, and we're going to talk about the motives and why people wanted him dead. The people that wanted him dead, why they wanted him dead. And uh, so anyway, we see that Judas was involved in the uh, being upset about the spikenard. We see that Lazarus was raised from the dead. Uh, we see that the, Jesus was anointed for his burial. And... Uh, it's interesting, all these events came into play and they were to result in the glorification of the Son of God, which is the glory of God. We're going to, we're going to learn what that means. So next, the question is, what does it mean to be glorified? Now, <laughs> a lot of people will use this word, glory to God. You know, we sing the song from Handel's Messiah, glory to God in the highest, and that's all great. But to be glorified uh, actually has a definition. So... I want to read some of these verses here first for you to understand. This is what uh, God said to uh, the children of Israel. He says, Therefore I will meet with the children of Israel. And, of course, this word, the tabernacles in italics in their King James Bible, because it's not there. It's what they, 
uh, would call, you know, not an omission, but it's a, uh, 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 a parabola. It's a parabolic absence. In other words, it's to draw attention to the tabernacle. And of course, the church is a tabernacle made without hands. And the tabernacle shall be sanctified, set aside, purified by my glory. So we see one definition of glory is that God's glory sanctifies, purifies the tabernacle. That would be the church. And he, uh, Isaiah says it this way, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. And so now we see a connection between God's name and his glory. Okay, God's name and his glory. And of course, God's name, which is the uh, title, the uh, uh, one word that defines, uh, that, that collects all the definitions of his glory, is found in his one name, and that sanctifies his tabernacle, uh, it reveals it. And so he says, I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. So if, if glory can be seen, and of course God told Moses, no man can see me and live, uh, we have something of a, of a little bit of a mystery here. So I'm going to continue along this vein. So God's glory is revealed by these things. Number one, his virtue and his character. His virtues and his character. Second, his passion and his works. Now when I use the word passion there, I mean it in the sense of his committed love and his works, his, his miracles, his power, his strength, his kindness, his holiness and his unique separateness. Holiness always means sovereignty, unique separateness, purity, uh, God is a part. He is, he is the one and only. There's none like him. That's really what the oneness of God is all about. There's only one God, and uh, he is the only one, the holy one, and his name is holy. So his glory is also revealed by his loving kindness, and, and this is the greatest definition of mercy and grace. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of definitions that people want to put on these two words, mercy and grace, but I think the best word to define mercy and grace is loving kindness that God is kind and he is loving. He is all loving and all kind. And his righteousness and his goodness, and these things are always connected. God does not uh, demonstrate goodness in have it being coupled with sin. In other words, he doesn't embellish his resume for the greater good. He doesn't sin for a greater good. It never works that way. His goodness and his righteousness are always coupled together. So you, you can't say that I'm going to lie about my testimony to get people saved and bring God's goodness to them. That does not wash. That's not Jesus. That's not God's glory. So his sovereign power and strength. God is sovereign. And, uh, of course, there's only one God, and, and uh, he is all-powerful. His strength is incredible, and his glory is going to be revealed uh, during his passion. His severity, uh, God's glory is also revealed by his severity, his judgment of sin. Many people criticize God because of uh, when Israel took over the promised land, they were told to execute judgment because of the sins of those people. This is simply the severity of God. People want to deny that God is severe and it resides next to his loving kindness. We have to accept the Bible's definition of God, not a man-made definition of goodness. Men want to define goodness as uh, equal rights. That's not God's definition. God's definition of goodness is he alone is good. And men always get corrupted by trying to define God in their own image. They want to make God into something that he's not. That is an idol. God is severe when he judges sin. He does judge sin because of his holiness and his unique separateness. Sin was never in God's original plan. That's something that man brought upon himself. He introduced that law of sin into his environment. That was never God's intention that that law would ever break forth upon men. And his word and creation reveal his glory. A lot of people say, well, there is no God. Well, all you got to do is look at DNA and, and realize there was a programmer. And uh, men think that they're going to be able to program their own creation by using God's invention of DNA. It's very doubtful that they'll ever get there. Uh, but his word and his creation reveal that God's glory, his His uh, uh, who he is. So God's glory is also revealed by the praise of his thankful, transformed worshipers. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to praise and, and be thankful to God without being transformed by God. 
And so God transforms us to be the thankful, grateful worshipers. I realize I'm missing the S in that word, but uh, uh, there it is anyway, the praise of his people. And God's glory is really revealed by the very definition of his name. That is his personal identity. So when you say God's name, okay, it should reveal his glory. It's the way that you think about him. And these are the aspects of the definition of his name, his virtual character, passion and works, etc., down to uh, his word and creation. So the highest glory asks this question. When did Moses see the glory of God? That would be the, a, a good place to start. Moses wanted to see it, and we see this in the verse, uh, Exodus 33, 20, and he said, God told him, you cannot see my face or his identity, for no man shall see me in my total identity, and that's really what he means, and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me. Now, I want to draw your attention to this word live, okay? There has to be a death in order to see God's total glory. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. You can stand upon this rock, and it shall come to pass that while my glory passes by, that I'll put thee in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover thee with my hand while I pass by. I'll take my hand away, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. So in other words, his face is that total glory, and to see his face requires a death. That's what God is telling Moses. And so Moses made two tables of stone. He went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord commanded him. The Lord descended in a cloud, stood with him there. And look what God does. He proclaims the name of the Lord. So the name of God, okay, declares his glory. It's his definition. So now he defines his own name. The Lord passed by before him. He proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh God. He's merciful. He's gracious. Notice he comes up with his loving kindness first. He's long-suffering. He has great patience. Most of us would like to see Jesus return today, but his great patience for the, for the fruit is why God is waiting. It's not that he approves of sin or that he doesn't see the wickedness in our world today, but he has long-suffering for the fruit. And he's abundant in goodness. There's the next definition. <laughs> he's totally abundant in goodness. He's got a lot to give. And then, of course, we see that truth comes out. God never sacrifices truth for salvation. Salvation and truth always go together. God doesn't say, well, you know, I'm going to lie to you to keep you safe. He does not do that. Truth is part of God's uh, glory. And he keeps mercy for thousands. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. But look at this part here. He will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and he says, under the third and fourth generation. In other words, this is God's severity. And, and the response to God's uh, revelation of his glory is that Moses made haste, bowed his head, worshipped. Okay, that was the response to God's glory. That's part of revealing God's glory. So we, we established a principle there. Why did Jesus, this is the next question, why did Jesus ride into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass, not on a white horse or king's mule? And this is really to show God's glory. And we're going to see it right here. Matthew 21 says, Tell the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy king comes unto thee meek. See that word meek? Sitting upon an ass and a colt of the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the ass and the colt. They put on them their clothes. They set him on. The, you know, they lifted him up, didn't they? It's like like carrying a... Uh, the coach, after, after he wins the Super Bowl on your shoulders, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and followed, they cried and said, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And this is worship. They are worshiping Jesus Christ. So what's going on here? So, we see that Jesus fulfilled the Zechariah 9-9 prophecy. Behold, your king comes riding on an ass. And this is also the fulfillment of Psalm 118, the king's coronation. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And of course, Jesus said when he was rejected by the priests who were supposed to participate in this coronation, when he was rejected by the priests at the temple, he said, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And so, we see that, that this coronation has to be uh, um, finished 
in the end time, before the arrival of Jesus Christ. They're going to have to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is all found in Psalm 118. That's why they said Hosanna. And of course, we know that Hosanna, uh, they would pronounce it Yesha, which is actually his name. To reveal his kingship and Davidic identity. That's why he came in on an animal coming to the temple. Now we know that uh, uh, David and Solomon came in on the king's mule, okay? But Jesus comes in even more humble than these people. And that was the problem with their leadership, David's and Solomon's and Saul's leadership, was that it was absent of total humility. There was always a pride or a lust in their leadership. And that's why men cannot lead without accountability, because they have these defects, <laughs> they, the law of sin that dwells in their members. So, but Jesus comes in total humility plus courage. And this is the definition of meekness. Humility and courage. It took courage to come in on that donkey that day, that foal of an ass. And uh, that's how Jesus reveals true leadership is through meekness, which is humility plus courage. Or uh, another definition for courage would be mental toughness. You know, uh, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness if you are the Son of God. Had he responded and said, what do you mean, devil? I am the Son of God. He would have testified uh, the testimony of one man. And, of course, we know from John 5.31, the testimony of one man is not true. And, therefore, Jesus would have sinned by self-declaring who he was, the Son of God. And he was wise enough to avoid that temptation. So we see his humility. We see his courage. Yesha, Hosanna, we talked about that. And we talked about the king's coronation ceremony it has to be finished at the temple. It began on the road to the temple where the people uh, certainly praised him and revealed his identity, but the uh, priests would not give him the glory. And they were to cross their swords, allow him to walk in between them. They were, they were to form a rank of two rows of priests, and they were supposed to shout out, God save the king. You'll find that in Psalm 118. You'll find it when Solomon was coronated. You'll find that every coronation of a king in Israel, they had to, they had to shout, God save the king. Why did Jesus eat the Passover meal the evening of his arrest? This is a, another question uh, about his glory. So why did he eat it at the evening of his, his arrest? Let's talk about that. Here it is in Luke 22. The hour was come. He sat down with the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles, that included Judas. He said unto them, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not no more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, he gave thanks, and said, This, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will no longer drink from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And then we go on. He took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it unto them, and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. Notice it says new. That is not a renewed covenant that people want to, uh, the Judaizers want to say this is a renewed covenant. It is not. It is a totally new covenant of blood, which is shed for you. Behold, the hand of him that betrays me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes, and it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So we see that the, this is the, uh, the, the, the Passover, uh, the Last Supper, which initiates a new covenant. Why? A new covenant is always celebrated with a meal. The Passover symbolizes deliverance from slavery. A covenant is memorialized or renewed with a celebratory meal. In other words, we renew our covenant when we take communion at church. And a meal indicates personal friendliness and relationship. It's a time of final preparation. And the, the meal reveals who is true and who is false. And of course, a covenant has to be initiated with a blood sacrifice this type of covenant. So, that's, that's why he did the Last Supper. Who arrested Jesus? Well, here's the answer. Judas, he received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. He came with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus knew all things that should come upon him. He went forth and said unto them, Who do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto him, I am. Notice that word, he is in italics, because that's what Jesus said, I am. He said, Haya in Hebrew. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said to them, I am, they fell backwards, they fell to the ground. Jesus asked them again, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I told you, I am. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. 
that his saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of them which thou gavest me have I lost none so notice that Jesus is willing to go to be arrested he doesn't resist even though his disciples kind of act out at this point and I'm not going to talk about that but you can read that on your own so what was the motives of all these people that were there who arrested Jesus and what was their motives Judas his motive was competitive jealousy he wanted recognition so when Mary was, was, was washing Jesus' feet with her hair, and she had used the uh, spikenard on his feet, Judas said, this should be sold for money that we can give to the poor, a greater good. He's got it wrong. Okay, What he really wanted was he, he disliked the fact that this woman was getting the attention of Jesus, and he had competitive jealousy in him. I want to be the Most High. I want to be the most recognized disciple. And, of course, uh, 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 his reasoning followed Simon the leper. Of course, the word leper means sin. Simon the leper was clearly Judas's father. Uh, he was from Bethany as well. He knew Mary, uh, Martha, and Lazarus. And we see what his motivation was. This was why he betrayed Jesus, because of competitive jealousy. In the church, we are to cooperate, not compete. We are not running a race, looking at each other, see who gets ahead, who's the highest, who gets the most attaboys from the pastor? Who's the biggest brown noser in the church? That's competitive jealousy. And of course, we need to beware as leaders of false flattery and uh, what people are after. So the Levitical priests, why did, they, why did they arrest Jesus? Because the Messiah cannot be from Jesus. They had totally not understood that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They didn't know that. And, and nobody told them. This was the big omission fact of Jesus' life. Nobody came to tell him that Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem. Now Mary could have told him, but she never told him. In fact, I think this fact was deliberate. I think that Jesus never wanted it revealed about his uh, birth in Bethlehem, the star of Bethlehem. They didn't know any of this. Although they could have, they could have found out that the wise men from the east came, followed the star. Uh, they, they certainly would have known that Herod tried to kill all the children in Bethlehem, but they never asked Jesus, where were you born? They just assumed he was born in Nazareth. You can't assume anything. You've got to find out the facts. And these Levitical priests, who were temple guards, who were supposed to assist you know, the, the high priest in his duties, they came and arrested him with spears and weapons. Now the Aaronite priests, these are the Cohens, the high priest family, they also felt competitive jealousy. Okay? They were afraid of losing the cash register, their role of leading the nation, of being the, uh, the high uh, popes, the grand pubas of, of the Bible. And of course, Jesus was demonstrating the word all the time through his miracles, signs, wonders, as well as his wisdom. He taught people as if, as if he had authority, and they understood that. He was different. He was messianic. And what they should have done is got behind him and worshipped him and supported his ministry. But they were feeling competitive. We're going to lose the cash register. We're going to lose that money. We're going to lose our power and our influence. And that's really what they wanted. And uh, then, of course, the Sanhedrin Pharisees, these are the princes of Israel, the, the, uh, the creme de la creme, those that are supposed to lead society. They were more concerned about the Roman government and political expediency. In other words, we can have no king but Caesar. And they didn't want to make Jesus a king because of politics. Listen. Jesus didn't carry signs saying uh, Democrat or Republican. He, he didn't carry any sign at all. In fact, he just did the work that the Father gave him to do, the Spirit gave him to do. He always followed what the Spirit led him to do. And he didn't get involved in politics trying to bring Christianity into the world. That is the wrong approach. So when you got groups that uh, come out of uh, uh, some of these uh, right-wing or left-wing groups that try to use religion to elect the right candidate, that's hogwash. That is not the way of Jesus. So, finally, we get to this point here. What did Jesus' resurrection reveal? What did it really reveal? Let's look at the resurrection. First, this scripture, Psalm 16, 9-10. Therefore my heart is glad, my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, or in the abode of the dead. Neither wilt thou allow thine holy one to see corruption. Now, Jesus knew this scripture, but his disciples did not. They did not know the Bible foretold that the Messiah would resurrect. And of course, this was why they couldn't believe that, that uh, 
after Jesus was crucified, they thought it was all over for them. And that was a huge misconception. And that's what one of the things about the resurrection that's so powerful is that it educated them. Look what it says about them. For as yet the disciples knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead, Psalm 16. Then the disciples went away into their own house. Mary stood outside the sepulcher, weeping as she wept. She stooped down, looked into the sepulcher, saw two witnesses, two angels in white, sitting at the head and the foot, where Jesus' body had lain in the tomb. And they said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they have left him, laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing. What a revelation. <laughs> Jesus was standing. He had resurrected. He had bodily resurrected. And she didn't recognize him until he said her name. But she did not expect a resurrected uh, Messiah. And here he was, resurrected. He had somehow defeated death. So let's look at what the resurrection revealed. Jesus' resurrection revealed that sin can be defeated by perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Did the law of sin dwell in Jesus' members? Yes, but he defeated the law of sin through the strength of the Spirit. That doesn't mean Jesus had a sin nature. That just means that Jesus operated in the same environment. He was tempted just as we are by the law of sin. It's a universal law, and what it does is it causes our bodies to die. But the law of sin is not the act of sin. Jesus never sinned. He had the strength of the Spirit. The Father dwelled in him in fullness. All the fullness of the Godhead was in him. Now you know why he was able to defeat the law of sin. It was a big wrestling match. And of course, Satan came to him with the most subtle temptation of all. If you're the Son of God, self-declare. You know, command these stones to be made bread. That was all a ruse to get him to self-declare. Even while he's on the cross, the high priest comes to him and says, if you're the Son of God, you know, come on down from that cross. And the people that were crucified next to him said, if you're the Son of God, get us down from this cross uh, along with yourself. It always was this, if you're the Son of God. That was Satan's subtlety, trying to get Jesus to self-declare. If people self-declare and say, I am a prophet, I am an apostle, I am a Messiah, get away from them. There is no self-declaration, there is no pride uh, in Christ. He was totally meek which is humble plus courageous. The second thing the resurrection revealed that Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's still alive. He's still alive. He's living. He's not dead. He's not in a tomb. I mean, all these people that are looking for the ossuary box of Jesus, the tomb of Jesus, and finding his bones, etc., keep looking. You're never going to find it because he's alive and he can live inside of us. That's the main thing. The other thing about the resurrection is that Jesus' promises can be believed. You can bank on them. Just as he said, you know, I must suffer, but in three days I will raise, be raised from the dead. He declared that. They knew that promise. He can be believed. So the power of resurrection is available to all people. That's one of the things that is revealed by Jesus. It's available to us. And we're going to talk about that at the end of this lesson. Jesus is also a resurrected son of God, Acts 13.33. Quote Psalm 2.7. That's Paul. Paul is revealing that Jesus is a resurrected son of God. And, of course, we know that the Son of God is the mysterious uh, manifestation of God manifest in flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. And the death from the law of sin can be remediated. In other words, you know, death came into the world because of the law of sin when Adam disobeyed God. It's just like the law of gravity. It came into the world that causes physical death. This can be remediated, just as you can remediate the soil and take out all the poison uh, from chemicals, etc. Death has been remediated by the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the passion and sacrifice precede resurrection. And, and this word sacrifice and passion go together. The zeal of the Lord hath consumed me. There needs to be a sacrifice in our own personal lives before we can be resurrected. And the Bible defines that sacrifice as repentance. So death has been subdued. Life is good. Now, the people that don't take Jesus' offer of resurrection, they are doomed to an eternal death. Not only just a physical death, but a spiritual eternal death. Now this physical and spiritual death has been subdued by the death of Jesus Christ. If we apply it to our lives, and we're going to talk about that here at the end, on how to have life. It's not over when it appears to be over <laughs> with God. You know, every word is possible with God. So resurrection... The resurrection of Jesus reveals that resurrection is the highest glory of Jesus' name. His name means resurrection. So let's 
talk about those things. Just hold on a second while I change this. And here we go. So to conclude, Jesus' resurrection. How do we resurrect as believers? The Bible says we have to repent. We have to have our sacrifice. We need to be baptized, taking the name of Jesus in baptism. It has to be invoked over us. This gives us victory. It's the conquering name. The Nikael. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the conquering name. It remits our sins. It removes our sins permanently. And then it says, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that resurrection life of Jesus Christ in us. And that's what causes us to resurrect when the last trumpet sounds. So, um, I hope that you have a great Easter and you understand what the resurrection means. It reveals it's the highest revelation of the name of Jesus Christ. Take that to church today. Pray for your pastor and uh, fellowship. Have communion with your, your saints by fellowshipping. You can't, you can't fellowship without taking communion. You've got to be part of the church. You can't isolate yourself and have church at home watching me on the tube. You've got to go and fellowship with the brothers and uh, just worship the Lord and uh, Hosanna Him today and glorify His name when you get there. God bless you today. Have a great Sunday, an Easter Sunday, in Jesus' name.